Gentlemen, life is goodish. My name is Dave Gorman. I've got a remote control, a large screen and a laptop that is loaded up with things I want to get off my chest. And I'll be honest, you find me at what has been a stressful time, Shay Gorman. A couple of weeks ago, it felt like my whole world had caved in. Luckily, it was just my ceiling. Yeah, that... <laughs> that is the ceiling from our upstairs to our downstairs. I have known a few people who've knocked through from one room to another in the past, but in my experience, it's normally done horizontally. <laughs> what it means is that for the first time in my life, I've had to claim on the insurance. I've never done that before. It's all online these days. Mrs Gorman has been dealing with it, really, and as you can see, when we send them a message, they ask us to indicate how we're feeling by clicking on one of these faces. <laughs> and as you can see, We've clicked on the very unhappy face because our ceiling has collapsed. <laughs> and when you click on it, it turns it green. I have no idea what colours the others would go if you clicked on them. And nor has anyone else. <laughs> it's an insurance company. Who's clicking on anything other than unhappy when contacting their insurance company? And why do they need to know what mood we're in anyway? What's that got to do with anything? Why does everything have to be turned into data these days? A few months ago, I was returning home from a short trip overseas. I was at Heathrow Airport and I needed a wee, so I went to the toilet, where they had this. How clean was the toilet today? <laughs> and the same array of faces. Although I think this proves that we need to establish an international standard of face progression here. You can't have both of them putting the green face at the far end, but having them, one of them travel from happy to unhappy and one of them travel the other way back, can you? It doesn't make any sense. Is it just me here? Or do you agree that nobody should ever be that happy about having a shit in an airport? <laughs> Surely this system can't possibly deliver accurate results. The question is, how clean is this toilet? If this toilet is filthy, who is touching that button? <laughs> Imagine who else has been there. I'm sorry, Heathrow, I'm not touching your smiley faces because I'm worried about your slimy feces. <laughs> I know, sorry. Why does everything have to come down to market research these days? I was looking at some news the other day. I went to the Guardian website and the moment I got there, this popped up. Thank you for visiting The Guardian. You have been selected to participate in a brief customer satisfaction survey to let us know how we can improve your experience. You're stopping me from having my experience by telling me you want me to tell you what my experience is like. This is like walking through the door of a restaurant and being greeted by a waiter whose first words are, how's your food? <laughs> this is like sitting in the barber's chair and instead of being asked how you'd like it, the first thing he does is pick up a mirror and show you the back of your own head. This is like when a comedian walks on stage at the start of a show and asks you if you're enjoying the show. Which is what I did to you lot earlier. <laughs> and you lot didn't bat an eyelid, did you? <laughs> Are you enjoying the show? Yeah. And you just went, yeah, yeah, yeah. There wasn't a show. <laughs> what were you thinking? All you'd done is walk in and sit down. There was nothing to enjoy yet. When this popped up on the Guardian website, I wasn't sure if it was legit or not. I'm very wary online. I'm thinking maybe it's a virus or some malware masquerading as something on the Guardian. So before I clicked yes or no, I thought I'd look it up. So I opened another browser and I could see that it's from a company called Forsey. So I googled them and I found their website, which is forsey.com. So I went there and this happened. We'd welcome your feedback. <laughs> If you fill in either of these surveys, what you get is a message that says, thank you for taking our survey and for helping us serve you better. And that's the rub, isn't it? When companies ask you for your opinion, the idea is that it's going to help them to give you what you want. And maybe that's good. But there's a paranoid part of my brain that thinks maybe they're trying to find my soft underbelly. Maybe they're trying to find ways of exploiting me. And I worry that I'm alone in this. I think most people have given in. Market research is happening everywhere and people are so used to it they don't even stop to think about what they're saying when they just give their data up without a thought. I wanted to see if people really are immune to it. I wanted to see whether people would notice if we conducted a survey about absolutely nothing if people would just go along with it. And they do. <laughs> Here we go, right? That is Annabelle Porter, a very good friend of the show, with the mic, asking the questions. The man with the glasses there, he, to me, he is the hero of the piece. You will see why. So question one is essentially, how happy are you to be doing this survey? But with a little more to it. How 
how happy are you to take part in this survey? One very happy, two quite happy, three neither happy nor unhappy, four quite unhappy, five very unhappy. OK, and this is how most people responded. Three neither happy or unhappy. Three. Three? I think three. Uh, three. Indifferent, really. Yeah, most people choosing three, not bothered, that makes sense. What would have been weird is if anyone had said five. <laughs> I voluntarily stopped to do this survey and I am furious about it. <laughs> Nobody said that. A few people said one and our hero was amongst them. Completely happy, one, totally happy. He's still in the pack with the rest of us, but I think he's giving it a little bit more thought than other people. This is question two. How would you rate my conduct in this survey to this point? Have I been, one, exceedingly polite and a pleasure to deal with, two, quite polite, three, neither polite nor impolite, four, quite impolite, five, downright rude? <laughs> <laughs> you can see it's in his eyes. It's starting to register that this is unusual. <laughs> and what does she mean, my conduct to this point? To this point, you've asked me one question, that's it. <laughs> But he's not breaking cover just yet. Most people are very impressed with Annabelle's conduct. Uh, the first one, very polite. One. One. I'd say one, definitely. One. he being very polite. One, obviously. Thank you very much. It's fine. Yeah, a bit flirty, though, Sue, right? <laughs> just a little bit. Our hero gives it some thought, but he still stays with the crowd. Um, I don't really know you, but I would still go for one, I'd say one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bit of tension creeping in here, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. OK. <laughs> ooh, ooh, it's getting frosty, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Question three. Thinking of other surveys you might have taken recently, is this one more professional, less professional, or about the same? <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing happening at all! And yet everyone else... I'd say it's very professional. Professional. More professional. Uh, about the same. About the same? About the same. I'd say about the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's every bit as professional as other surveys people have done, and in some cases, more so. <laughs> but not for our hero. I don't normally do surveys, so I couldn't comment on that one. He's just getting a bit tenser, isn't he? A bit tenser. Question four. Your feedback is important to us, and we hope your experience with us enhances your day. <laughs> what one thing could we have done to improve this feedback gathering? <laughs> <laughs> What one thing could we have done to improve this feedback gathering? We've only asked four questions. This is the moment where he kind of snaps, but only him. Everyone else knows what we could have done to improve the feedback gathering. They all have an answer, which is basically free stuff. <laughs> what one thing could you do to improve it? Have some sweets or something. <laughs> Give away free... I'm not quite sure what I'm feeding back on. Sandwiches. Do you want to enhance a bit more about what the feedback is I'm supposed to be giving you? Oh, giving me coffee. Feedback on what? On, on the feedback. I can't, I'm kind of not getting this. Uh, offer me a free drink. OK, what am I telling you? What is the survey, though? Oh, that's all. Thank you very much for your time. OK, cool. <laughs> what I love about this is that you laugh at him because in the context of these videos, he seems like the oddity, but the truth is, he is the only person you have seen behaving rationally. Everyone else is being weird by just going along with this nonsense. That is how immune society is to market research. Now, you can probably gather that market research, feedback and data is going to be the topic of tonight's show. And I'll be honest, when I told the producers I wanted to talk about this stuff, it caused a bit of a ripple within the channel. Because they, as a body, they are deeply embedded in this world. They do market research, of course they do. Our executive producer genuinely came back to me saying, I need to take this upstairs and see if they're happy with this. We don't want to upset the market research people. <laughs> I kid you not. He came back two days later saying, no, you're absolutely fine to do it. Apparently, your audience loves that shit. <laughs> How do they know? Ladies and gentlemen, we'll talk more about this after the break.
Britain, life is goodish. My name is Dave Gorman, and tonight we've been discussing market research. And while we're on the topic, if you don't mind, I'd like to do a bit of market research here tonight, OK? Uh, it's going to be very simple. All I need to do is ask everyone to just put their hands up, OK? And only put your hand down when what I'm saying doesn't describe you. So everyone put all your hands up. Not two hands, just one, one all. <laughs> One will do. One hand up. Uh, and lower them if what I'm saying is not you, OK? So keep your hands up if you are male. I could have given you a shortcut there, ladies, couldn't I? I, I definitely could have done. <laughs> keep your hands up if you agree with the statement, over history, religion has done more harm than good. OK? Keep your hands up if you would describe yourself fairly, no judgement on my part at all, as middle class. OK. Still a good fair for you. Keep your hands up if you like science. <laughs> Keep your hands up if you would describe yourself as geeky. <laughs> Keep your hands up if you would describe yourself as disorganised. We've got one, two, three, four. The person who's going, like, you are disorganised. That's... <laughs> That's what that means, right there. There's still a few. Keep your hands up if you read The Guardian. <laughs> We've basically got one person that I can see over here. What, what's, what's your name, sir? Uh, Benjamin. Benjamin. Very nice to meet you, Benjamin. What we've just done there, Benjamin, is we've proved that an organisation called YouGov are shit. Because <laughs> what I just described there was, according to YouGov, my typical fan. And we've only got one in. <laughs> We've only got Benjamin here. It's useless. Ridiculous. I don't know if you are familiar with YouGov. You see it in the news quite a lot. You'll, you'll see some people like, oh, according to a YouGov survey and so on. And because of the Gov bit, I spent quite a long time assuming it was some official governmental organisation. But it's not. It's just a market research company. They have this thing on their website called the YouGov Profiles. See what we already know about your customers. I'm not really sure what it's for, because the sentence, Profiles is our segmentation and media planning product for agencies and brands, makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> I understand all of the individual words. I just don't understand what they're doing hanging around together <laughs> in that paragraph. My guess is that it's to help businesses work out who their audience is so they can best target their advertising. Anyway, you can use it to search for any brand, person or thing, which is a convoluted way of saying you can use it to search for anything. <laughs> I'll show you how it works. Let's, let's use Cheryl Cole, just as an example, OK? So if you search for Cheryl Cole, you type it in, it knows who she is, it finds her, and then you hit return, and all of a sudden, all these red dots are buzzing into the middle, each of them representing one of the fans in their database of Cheryl Cole. And as you can see, they found 2,829 fans of Cheryl Cole. And then it all resolves, and it finds you the typical, the quintessential Cheryl Cole fan, who, as you can see, is a 25 to 39-year-old young woman uh, who is, their, their word, social grade C, C2DE, which is their language, and that means working class, OK? Now, incidentally, when you saw all those red dots buzzing around, I said that was sort of one per fan. It's not a literal animation. It doesn't actually... There isn't a one-to-one -one representation. I don't think there were 2,829 red dots there. You can test that theory by searching for something different. Uh, for example, this is what happens if you search for Sunita. Uh, Sunita, finding all the fans of Sunita, there you go, and it finds 27... <laughs> Fans of Sunita, there are definitely more than 27 red dots there. I can prove that. That is 27 red dots right there. <laughs> the rest are surplus to requirements. And by the way, I am not picking on Sunita. I would go so far as to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, I am much more of a Sunita person than a Cheryl person. In fact, YouGov's research bears that out. If I just run this on, you'll see the typical Sunita fan emerge. And as you can see, that is far more me. <laughs> far more me. Isn't it? I mean, I'm not a working-class man and I'm not over 60, but it is still more me than the Cheryl Cole fan, isn't it? <laughs> Cheryl gets a part-time model and Sunita gets a part-time groundskeeper from a non-league football club. <laughs> it's worth looking around just to see who other people get. Mary Berry's typical fan is apparently Mary Berry. <laughs> 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 
Anyway, just to show you around the site, let's go back to Cheryl Cole and take a look at what kind of information it shows to you. Uh, you can see the typical professions that they work in. In her case, they think they work in the entertainment profession. Shows you how much disposable income they've got. In Cheryl's case, it's less than £125 a month. It tells you where they're from. What region would you expect the Cheryl Cole fan base to be at its strongest? The North East, Newcastle, you're absolutely right where she's from. That's the strong base for her. It also shows you where people are on the political spectrum. Yeah. Where do you imagine Cheryl Cole's fans are on the political spectrum? We know they're, they're working class girls from Newcastle. Is that a clue or not? Where do you think they are on the spectrum? Non-voting. Non-voting, you think, right, right in the middle then? No. Actually, they're really, really right wing. <laughs> Yeah, Cheryl Cole's fans, right-wing, working-class Newcastle girls whose favourite food is chips and curry sauce. <laughs> they like chips and curry sauce, they just think the person who made that sauce can go home now, basically. <laughs> That's Cheryl Cole fans, according to this. Their favourite sport is darts. <laughs> it's a confusing world, this, isn't it? <laughs> These are the different avatars they have to represent every kind of adult in Britain. These avatars represent middle-class and working-class people across four age groups and in two genders, which makes 16 distinct types of person. That there is my guy. <laughs> As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, I get middle-class men who are a little bit left-wing, uh, who are from the Midlands, which is where I'm from, and who work in IT. And I've got loads of disposable income, 500 to 990 pounds. I'd have put my prices up if I'd bloody known that. <laughs> Weirdly, their favourite food, and I'm not making this up, is vegetarian toad in the hole. <laughs> Nobody's favourite food has ever been vegetarian toad in the hole. I don't eat meat, but I can say that with confidence. That is a compromised food, isn't it? <laughs> saying vegetarian toad in the hole is your favourite food is like saying your favourite mode of transport is a replacement bus service. <laughs> Nonsense. We told the people here that that's what the research said. As you came in tonight, if you were downstairs having a drink in the bar, having a bite to eat, that was on the bar. Vegetarian toad in the hole as a special. Not one person asked for it. <laughs> Not one person. Which is just as well because they haven't made any because we knew that nobody would ask for it. A lot of people appear to have a surprisingly right-wing fan base. For example, Little Mix. Look at Little Mix. Look how right-wing their fans are. Now, when I say surprisingly right-wing, I might even be clear here. I'm not using right-wing as a lazy insult. It's not a pejorative. You are entitled to your views. The key word is surprisingly. Let me put it in some context. Look at how right-wing Little Mix fans are, and now look at the political views of readers of Karl Marx. Just a, just a little bit to the left. Mousy Dong, bang in the middle. <laughs> little Mix fans right out here. Little Mix fans are much, much more right-wing than the fans of Karl Marx and Chairman Mao are left-wing. <laughs> Let me isolate the political ticker so you can see there is no sleight of hand here, right? That is how right-wing fans of Little Mix are. And this is how right-wing fans of Hitler are. <laughs> it's basically the same. Incidentally, you, Gov, fans of Hitler. <laughs> We've got a word for that these days, and it's not fans. They've got 28 fans, one more than Sunita. <laughs> Seriously, who are they asking these questions of? Keep your eye on the ticker, OK? So this is fans of Hitler, and this is Katie Hopkins. <laughs> Hopkins fans are more right-wing than Hitler's. Seriously, watch the ticker. Just watch the ticker. That's Katie Hopkins. Hitler. <laughs> Hopkins. Hitler. Hopkins. Little Mix. That is insane. <laughs> I don't think I understand the YouGov data. See if you can work this out. As you can see, there is a sample size of 149 people who have self-identified as fans of Little Mix. Hold that number in your head, 149 people, OK? Now, let's look at some other details about them. Their favourite food. Fried chicken and Yule log. <laughs> Yule log? Do you think they did this survey in December, by any chance? That's nobody's favourite food. The thing I'm more interested in is the bottom of the list. This is their top ten favourite dishes. Bottom of the pile, number ten, bitter melon soup. <laughs> I've never heard of bitter melon soup. I've never met anyone who's heard of bitter melon soup. To begin with, I assume that was a clerical error, and 149 Little Mix fans have said, oh, yeah, I quite like a bit of melon soup. But no. 
<laughs> no, it's not that. They actually mean bitter melon soup. So a significant number of 149 people who are saying they are fans of Little Mix must have also said that they like bitter melon soup. And if you remember, you can search for any brand, person or thing. And bitter melon soup is a thing. So we can search for it and see what the fans of bitter melon soup are like. And it turns out that they are quite old, middle class, and there's 40 of them, and look at how left-wing they are! <laughs> how do these numbers possibly fit together? This is the middle-class man over 60 we're looking at here. When I wanted to make that slide, uh, I had to sort of try and find a picture of each of the 16 avatars. I basically spent an hour on the Yougov profile, just guessing at things. Saying, what do working-class women like when they're, when they're 30? I don't know, I'll guess at something like that. Some of them very easy to find. Some of them less so. Uh, the over-60 middle-class man, he was very easy. I didn't guess at bitter melon soup, obviously. <laughs> I guessed at George Osborne. <laughs> and I got it right first time. That's who his fans are, the middle-class men over-60. Favourite foods for George Osborne fans? We've got veal, pheasant, partridge... <laughs> ..and even beluga caviar. <laughs> And I realised I've just made a classic TV mistake. Here I am on the box, and I've just mentioned beluga caviar. And now there are thousands of people at home thinking, oh, yeah, I could just do with a bit of beluga caviar. <laughs> Go on, then. Give yourself a quick caviar break. I'll see you in a little bit. Life is goodish. Now, before the break, we were discussing the market research company YouGov and their online profiler. Now, when I was trying to make this slide with all the avatars and I was spending my time trying to guess at the right things to give me the full range of people, I bumped into something that I found interesting for other reasons. Now, at one point, I thought, oh, I know, Ant and Deck, they'll lead me to the right character. But I discovered that YouGov didn't let me search for Ant and Deck as an entity. Ant is there and Deck is there. But Ant and Deck are not, which seems weird to me because I don't think it's possible to have different opinions about Ant and Deck. <laughs> there are a lot of people in Britain who don't even know which one is which. And given how big they are, that says something about how indivisible they really are. There is an easy system to remember which one's which. I'm sure plenty of you are aware of this. They always stand in Ant and Deck order. If you see them working, it's always Ant on the left and Deck on the right. That's why when Deck wants to drive, they always go on holiday to France. Now, <laughs> I like Ant and Deck. I think most other people do. So it seems to me that if YouGov's data is accurate, the fans that it describes for Ant should be exactly the same as the fans it describes for Deck. So let's take a look and see what it says when we compare fans of Ant and fans of Deck. Now, in terms of demographics, they both appeal to women uh, who are aged 40 to 59 and who are working class, and in tonight's show, they are played by Janet Street Porter. Um, <laughs> and what about where they're from? Where, where do you think they might be from? The North East. It's a good guess, and it's right in terms of Ant McPartland. Big fan base, North East. Not Deck. No, no. His fans are in the northwest. <laughs> That's confusing matters, isn't it? Now the one who stands on the left is popular in the right of the country, and the one who stands on the right is popular in the left. By my reckoning, if they want to get the best reaction, they need to do a show standing back to back in Keithley, West Yorkshire. <laughs> what about politically? Where, where do you think they are on the political spectrum? Any guesses? Labour, Labour you think? OK. Keep your eye on both tickers at the same time. <laughs> Ant's fans are really right-wing and Dex fans are a little bit left-wing. Again, confusing. The one who stands on the left is popular on the right and the one who stands on the right is popular on the left. But this suggests that their fans are different people. And to my mind, that suggests that YouGov's data must be wrong. It turns out there are loads of examples where differences are apparent where surely none should appear. Keep your eyes on the political ticker at all times, OK? These are the people who like baked potatoes. A little bit left-wing. These are the people who like twice-baked potatoes. <laughs> a little bit right-wing. That is the neatest expression of you get a bit more right-wing as you get older that I've ever seen. Yeah, basically, the time it takes to rebake your potato. <laughs> this is genuinely incredible. This is a threefer, this one. Look at this. The people who like the film, Lethal Weapon, quite right-wing. Lethal Weapon 2, Lethal Weapon 3. <laughs> How is that remotely possible? It just doesn't make any sense, does it? This is even weirder. Sooty and Co. <laughs> versus The Sooty Show. 
How could they be different people? Well, essentially, they're not different people. They are both middle-class women between 25 and 39, uh, and they're all in the West Country. <laughs> That's the fans of Sooty, apparently. <laughs> but look at their politics. Little bit left, all the way over there. <laughs> Who knew that Sooty was a Nazi? He kept that quiet, didn't he? <laughs> I think I know why fans of the Sooty show skew more right-wing than Sooty and Co. I think it's to do with the avatars they have chosen to represent these things. Look at that. <laughs> I mean, look. That isn't an accident, surely. Come on, is that the picture desk? Yeah, we'd like a picture of Sooty looking as much like Hitler as you can manage. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, talking of innocent childhood things that might or might not have been performing Nazi salutes, the world got into a bit of a tears recently after The Sun uncovered a video from 1933 of our own dear monarch appearing to do just that at the age of seven. Was she or wasn't she? I don't know. I do know that every newspaper in the land has published multiple stories discussing it. This is it in the mail. According to The Express, they hired expert lip readers to examine the footage, and they decided that she was simply waving. Uh, and, of course, it wasn't just the tabloids, either. Oh, no, The Guardian were on it, The Independent were on it, and so were the rest of them. And when something is as big a talking point as this, you can imagine that the bottom half of the internet becomes a seething cauldron of <laughs> hot-headed opinion to match. <laughs> and you know how much I like it when the bottom half of the internet gets all worked up about things. I spent some time wallowing in the comments I found down there, ladies and gentlemen. Real words written by real people that I present to you now, ladies and gentlemen, in the form of something that I like to call a found poem that I would like to perform for you now. Why is this a story? I'd understand why this was a story if she was still your queen. But Kate's in the chair now. <laughs> so why not let Grandma enjoy her old age and move on? I don't know where to start with that comment. I do. It's not a chair, it's a throne. <laughs> I feel sorry for the Queen in this situation. Imagine having to read all these headlines about something you did when you were seven. When I was seven, I killed a rabbit. in the papers, is it? <laughs> what do all those being outraged want the Queen to do exactly? Invent a time machine so she can go back and unsalute Hitler? <laughs> if someone can invent a time machine, they can think of something better to do to Hitler than unsalute him. <laughs> it is quite clear to me that the young Queen was just waving. She is a wonderful woman, a wonderful, waving woman. <laughs> it is well known that the royal family still open their Christmas presents on Christmas Eve. This is a German tradition. <laughs> it's time they stop pretending to be otherwise. The royals have weird waves. That much is a fact. But this wave has never been one of them. You can't judge that family by today's standards. It was 1933, for crying out loud. Nobody knew that she would go on to be queen. <laughs> in fairness to the royal family, it was wise to learn the salute, just in case we lost. <laughs> Apparently, an expert lip reader says it's not a salute. How would she know? You don't talk with your hands. <laughs> Italians talk with their hands. <laughs> yes, and look who they sided with in the war. <laughs> this is such nonsense. Leave them alone. Which family hasn't done that salute in fun? <laughs> Hang on. You killed a rabbit. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> the Bill Roth String Quartet, ladies and gentlemen. The Bill Roth String Quartet. A 
I'll see you after the break. Back to modern life is goodish. Now, it's probably obvious to you that I am a bit skeptical about market research, and this will, I hope, explain why. I was watching TV last year, and there was an ad break that I wasn't paying much attention to, especially as I'd taken in that the current ad wasn't really aimed at me. <laughs> but somehow, the words at the end of that ad still got through to my brain. And UK women loved it so much, they voted it product of the year. I remember thinking, blimey, that's a big claim, isn't it? I mean, when you say something is the blank of the year, you're surely saying it's the best whatever it is of the year, aren't you? If it's car of the year, you're saying you've assessed all of the cars released that year and you've decided that this car is the best car. That's pretty much true, whether it's year, month, week, whatever. It's only when you get down to a day that it falls apart a little bit. You know, movie of the month means of all the new releases this month, this is the one to watch. Single of the week means of all the singles released this week, this is the one to get. Soup of the day, that's the one you've got the most of. Um, <laughs> just different, isn't it? Yeah. Lady of the night, something else entirely. <laughs> but my point is, when the words used are product of the year, that suggests to me that out of all the products, this one has been voted the best. But product is a big word, isn't it? Pretty much everything is a product. And to my idiot brain, they appear to be claiming that some sanitary pads are the best of all the products. But then I saw another ad that confused me further. Find just what you need to make a delicious lasagna in my Dolmio Lasagna Kids. Voted product of the year. So now there appear to be two different products claiming to be the best of all the products. And then I saw this. Go Cat Crunchy and Tender, now voted product of the year. At which point I realised I was obviously missing some vital detail. Because it's not possible for all three things to just be... Product of the year. It's not, is it? <laughs> So I started reading the small print and looking at the Product of the Year website. And every time I did that, I got more and more suspicious and it seemed less and less impressive. The first thing I found out, which should have been obvious, is that there are different categories. It's there on the adverts themselves, as you can see. There's the Fem Care category, the Convenience Meal category, the Cat Food category. And in each case, a company called TNS have surveyed 11,941 people to find this out. And that makes more sense, doesn't it? Because while claiming that a cat food is the best out of all the things in the world seems a bit silly, <laughs> saying it's the best of all the cat foods, well, that kind of makes sense. But then I looked a little closer. And I discovered that despite what the words voted product of the year in the cat food category sound like, they don't mean voted best cat food out of all the cat foods. <laughs> no. Now, if I'd looked at the ads properly in the first place, I would have seen that the product of the year logo, it actually makes it perfectly clear that this is a survey of product innovation. So only products that are innovative are allowed. So what they mean when they say product of the year in the cat food category is just the best of all the new or innovative cat foods, which is just a little bit less impressive. And also, not entirely what they mean. <laughs> because they don't consider all of the new or innovative cat foods. They're not assessing the whole market. The products have to enter the awards. So it gets a bit less impressive still, especially when you find out what's involved in entering the awards. I was looking at the FAQs on the Product of the Year website when I saw this. How much does it cost? And my first thought was, well, that's a very decent thing of these people to do, to tell us how much it costs them to run their awards. <laughs> but that's not what it tells you. No. How much does it cost? Entry to Product of the Year is free. That's good. If your product makes it through the jewellery selection, there is a finalist fee of £2,750. So if you are deemed eligible for the award, you have to give them 2,750 quid. And in return for that, you get a market research kind of report. But then, if your product is voted product of the year, there is a one-time winner fee of 15,500 pounds. That is on top of the 2,750 quid you've already given them. So winning this award costs you 18,250 quid. And I guess, 
that must be worth it because for that you get to put their logo on your product and you get to make TV ads saying Now voted product of the year Which idiots like me will hear and think mean you're the best out of all the products just because those are the words you're using <laughs> Now, knowing that they make 18,250 quid out of every winner made me wonder, how many categories are there? <laughs> so I looked at the website again and I saw that one of the Effley Aid cues is, what are the categories? And it turns out that the exact category names are determined by TNS after all entries are received. <laughs> and call me a cynic, but that seems like quite a trick to pull. Because it seems to me they have a financial incentive to have as many winners as possible. Are you thinking the same? <laughs> Let me be very clear. I am not saying that they deliberately decide the categories after the event in a way that maximises the number of awards and therefore the income they make from it. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying <laughs> is that if I was in charge of them, that's what I would do. <laughs> Now, they explain that they do this because of the innovative nature of the awards, which means that new products might come along that wouldn't have existed a few years earlier. But they also say that they work with TNS, their research company, to make sure only comparable products compete with each other and there are never less than two or more than six products in a category. Which is a bit odd, isn't it? What do they do if seven genuinely innovative cat foods enter? As you can't see how many categories there are in advance, I thought I'd look to see how many there were this year just by counting this year's winners. And there were 43 winners. 43 different products of the year, each paying 18,250 quid. And at least 43 runners up, each paying 2,750 quid a pop. That makes 903,000 pounds through the gate right from the off. At which point, I was thinking, I wonder if I could steal this business model and make it work in another country. <laughs> Alas, no. Because Product of the Year does exist in other countries. Does it exist in other countries? Yes. In over 40 countries, making its debut most recently in America, Canada, India and so on. Curiosity got the better of me. I looked through the American website as well. They had 30 winners this year who all paid $70,000. And that means there were at least 30 runners-up and they all paid $7,000. And that makes an amazing $2,310,000, which translates to nearly one and a half million quid. This product of the year thing is quite a business. Now, to get an idea as to how the process works, Let's take a look at two of the products that entered the 2015 awards. We have Benelin Chesty Cough and Cold Tablets and Sudafed Congestion and Headache Relief Max Strength Capsules. Which one of these two products do you think ran out the winner? It's hard to know, isn't it? I'll tell you what, let's do our own survey, OK? It obviously won't be anywhere near as scientific or lucrative as the one run by Product of the Year. <laughs> But let's see which of these two products we think should win the award. Let me tell you a bit about them. Uh, Benelin says that it is for colds. Uh, Sudafed says that it is for head colds. Uh, they both say that they deal with congestion. They both say they deal with headaches. They both contain paracetamol. And they both contain something called phenylephrine. It's a tough call, isn't it? Because they seem so similar. But by show of hands, who here thinks that Benelin chesty cough and cold tablets deserves the nod? few people. And who thinks that Sudafed congestion and headache tablets, max strength capsules, deserves it? And is anyone thinking, look, Dave, making these two products compete against one another is ridiculous. Yes, they're both medicines that are aimed at colds and headaches and congestion, and yes, they both contain paracetamol and phenylephrine, but they are clearly very different products that in any fair and just world should be competing in different categories. <laughs> You're not thinking they should be in separate categories, are you? That's why I was surprised to discover that they had both won Product of the Year 2015. <laughs> Benelin won in the cough and cold category and Sudafed in the general healthcare category. And the conspiracy theorists amongst you will probably enjoy noticing that both products are made by the parent company Johnson & Johnson, <laughs> who will have paid £36,500 for the privilege of winning twice. Telling me these two products are winners in different categories is like telling me that John has won an award for Best Irish Pop Star in a Twin Act and Edward has won an award for Best Twin Pop Star from an Irish Act. <laughs> and yes, I have used the same picture of both of them. We have to pay to licence photos like this and I'm not using two different pictures of identical twins, all right? <laughs> So, Benelin and Sudafed are both Johnson & Johnson products. I thought if I knew what else was in the cough and cold category and what else was in the general healthcare category, it might all make sense. 
And so I called them and I spoke to a lovely lady called Helga. And I explained who I was and I said that I was thinking about talking about it in the show. And I said I really wanted to understand why products that seemed very similar were in different categories. And that the only reason I wanted to know who the runners-up were was so that I could better understand how the categories worked. And Helga basically said, look, you're a comedian and you're going to say what you like and that's fair enough, but we're not here to help you. Which, if you think about it, is odd. Because it seems to me that if she had an answer that made the categories make more sense, it wouldn't have helped me. It would have helped them. <laughs> this is just how my head works. But the answer, we don't answer that because we don't want to help you to take the piss out of us, carries with it just a hint of, if we told you that, you'd slaughter us. <laughs> and so what am I supposed to think about that? Anyway, look, I apologise for uh, what is a kind of abrupt change in the subject, uh, but something new I want to introduce to the show, I need to do it now. Uh, I've decided to start running a Modern Life is Goodish Employee of the Week <laughs> scheme. And I know the crew are all very excited about this. My stats team have been busy working out who the winners are, so hopefully Andy, the stat man, should be able to pop up with the golden envelope. Ladies and gentlemen, please make Andy very welcome as he <laughs> makes his way. Thank you very much, Andy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Andy, ladies and gentlemen, that's Andy. Yeah, yeah, he's a big fan, he's a big fan. Um, <laughs> that's Andy, I'll just take the envelope from you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Andy, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs> well, this is exciting, exciting stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the first award is for the employee of the week, uh, is in the category handheld camera, brackets, right handed. Um, <laughs> And the winner is, ladies and gentlemen, it's Mauro! It's Mauro! There he is over there, right-handed Mauro. Come on down, Mauro. Collect your award. Congratulations, Mauro. It's 40 quid, Mauro. 40 quid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mauro, ladies and gentlemen, now, the, the first of our winners. The employee of the week. There you go, Mauro, an award-winning cameraman, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, I'm pretty sure the whole crew here are award-winning. They certainly will be by the end of the night. Um, <laughs> although I think we might have to do the rest of the awards after the show. The classical music category is going to be very hotly contested. <laughs> as will the large stringed instrument category. <laughs> and the small stringed instrument category. And the supporting artist in a found poem category. Good luck, guys. <laughs> I'm rooting for you. Now, look, I think we've learned something tonight. I think we've learned that we all need to be a bit more like this man. But I think we can go further. This is what I think we should do. I think we should all start agreeing to every survey. And I think we should be honest at all times, answer every question, give them whatever information they ask for, with one exception. Whenever you are asked what your favourite food is, tell them it is bitter melon soup. <laughs> Let's push bitter melon soup to the top of the agenda. Let's get the money men investing in bitter melon soup. Let's push it at every turn. And if we all do that, then in a few years' time, maybe they'll start advertising bitter melon soup on the TV. And if that happens, we have to remember that we must not succumb. Don't buy bitter melon soup because you see it being promoted on the television or because the style papers are recommending it. Remember, they'll only be doing that because of the collective lie that we agreed to start telling tonight. <laughs> Let them lose their houses backing soup we've never heard of. Let them make bitter melon soup the product of the year. And let them learn the lesson that data doesn't have to rule our lives. But most of all, I think we've learned, ladies and gentlemen, that modern life is good. Ish. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. Good night.